So I'm Dickie. Um, I run a project called Breaking Ground Heritage, which uses archaeology and heritage as a way to promote um, a recovery pathway um, to the service community. And when I say the service community, I mean serving members of the British military um, and veteran members as well, so people from the Falklands um, all the way through to um, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so it's important to understand um, the type of people that um, we deal with. So some of the most um, common afflictions to the people that get involved in our projects. Um, we're looking at people that suffer from intrusive thoughts. So you look at like PTSD symptoms here. Um, thoughts that will, um, they'll be doing mundane daily tasks and all of a sudden they will get thoughts that come into the head that will be a flashback from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from a car crash, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so we have people dealing with um, the, the whole flashbacks. Um, sleeplessness, memory problems, um, anger issues, I think we can all relate to a lot of these actually. Um, hypervigilance, so people are coming on projects and they're unable to settle down, they're unable to rest, okay, they're constantly looking uh, for markers, looking for windows that may be open, looking for markers to say that maybe an IED somewhere, looking for cars driving a bit suspicious, so these guys are constantly um, looking out for, for threats. Um, restlessness, they can't sit down, you'll, you'll notice me, I fidget quite a lot, I can't, I can't help it. Um, you can't, you're constantly moving. Um, nightmares, again, goes kind of hand in hand with a flashback, really. The self-imposed isolation. Um, one of the things that we're starting to see about the mental health side of things is when people start to go on that downward trajectory with mental health, the first thing that we notice is that they start to isolate themselves, whether it be on social media, so you do see they kind of do, they do withdraw. Um, they have a, a severe lack of concentration, um, a lack of motivation, well, don't we all? Um, and the imminent flash to bang. Um, the imminent flash to bang is, is an interesting one for us. And it kind of goes hand in hand with anger. Um, a car, you're in your car driving along uh, and somebody cuts you up and there's normally an escalation. I would rather, I'm miffed at that, that's really annoyed me to the Oh, that was a bit dangerous to the, well, that's really pissed me off. Well, this imminent flash to bang is it goes from being um, someone cuts you up to wanting to get out of your car to really pull their head off for no reason whatsoever other than it's just an instant escalation. So these are the symptoms that most of our participants will um, dis uh, declare that they're suffering from um, in their daily life. And then the last one is burdensomeness. These guys are very independent. When I say guys, I mean ladies and gentlemen. Uh, th these people are very independent, they're, they're, they're used to thinking for themselves, they're used to being the best at what they do, and all of a sudden they're now dependent on other people, dependent on, on the health service, uh, and dependent on charities, so they become, uh, they feel like they're a big burden to themselves. So what do we do? Um, we try to combat some of them um, symptoms by using archaeology and heritage. Um, we do archaeological excavations with a project called Operation Nightingale. I don't know if that's come across here at all. Um, we do research projects with universities. Um, we do building projects, i.e. we built a First World War tank out of wood because we could. Um, we do outreach work in schools, festivals, events, um, giving participants that um, exposure to doing something different, maybe outside their comfort zone, but also pass on their experiences to, uh, to the general population itself. Um, we also run training modules, so we'll train people how to do human remains recovery. A bit weird, bearing in mind these people, their trauma comes from death and, and mutilation, so doing the human remains recovery, we found it actually a really good way to engage them because they're really interested in it, um, and we've never had any negative effects from that, really. Uh, things like archaeological photography um, and an introduction to researching and things. And again, we do that to provide the respite, promote recovery of pathways, and signpost them to employment and uh, education. Now, there's, there's a whole mix of different um, disciplines there, so the, the same thing doesn't interest everybody. Um, so we use archaeology as a way to, to um, get those people involved that are able to. Historical research for those that don't want to maybe engage with um, a social grouping, but they can do it from, the cell, uh, from their own home. Um, building projects for those that like to do things with their hands. So we try to do as much heritage-based projects as, uh, as possible to try and include as many people as possible. Um, 
and, and, and the reason we find this works is because archaeology generally is a set of processes. Um, the military guys are used to routines. They used to be told, okay, you will be up at seven o'clock, you will have your breakfast at half past seven, you will be ready at half past eight, you will do this at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock you will do this. So it's very formulatic, uh, formulaic. And archaeology is very much the same. There is a set course of doing things. You, don't, you can't just do it willy-nilly. You have to do it um, in a very um, definite way. Um, and the interesting thing about the UK, and I've, I've noticed it's not really um, happening so much out here, is we have the time team in the UK. Everybody in England knows about geophysics. Everybody knows about isotopes, and dendrochronology, because they watch the time team. Um, so we have people coming on these projects and we don't have to explain to them what geophysics is because they already know. You have kids at school that can tell you about geophysics. So these people have already come to you with a very fundamental understanding of archaeology. Um, so it's not some weird and wonderful um, science and magic and stuff. It is something that they actually understand. Um, and, and again, archaeology is, is looking for the unknown. So you do find like this photograph here, that's in Bulkor. You do find um, things that you're not expecting. So these are two German soldiers from the First World War. Um, so it does have its limitations. So taking um, servicemen that have been blown up or seen the colleagues killed, um, and then dealing with traumatic incidents like this, it, it can have its problems. It does have its problems. Um, but it's making sure that we've got the right um, team in place to be able to deal with it if it does become an issue, and um, how we can resolve it uh, there and then so it doesn't develop into something further. Now, some of the stuff we've been looking at. So we had a basic understanding of, of how these projects worked. Um, th there was a theory that came across um, through um, Karen Bernard's research. And basically, a veteran will come back from military service. And, and he doesn't want to talk about his time away because he doesn't want to um, worry his family with his experiences. His family then, in return, don't talk about anything traumatic or that might trigger a response to the individual because they don't want to um, create a problem with them, they don't want to create these tensions. So you have the buffers, you have a situation where you're at home and nothing's getting resolved, you know, you sat there, it's simmering and you're putting it away. Um, when we have the people who take them on these projects, they're with a like-minded group of people, uh, they're with people with shared experiences, um, the people that have probably served together and they've, they've been to Afghan, to Ireland or whatever. Um, so these people understand where these people come from, so they will actually sit there and they will talk to each other. Um, the amount of times I've been on a project and someone's turned around to me and said, you know what, that's the first time I've ever told anybody that. And I think, oh, that's brilliant. I think, actually, you've been in therapy for two years. Do you know what I mean? Why isn't your uh, why haven't you told your psychiatrist this? And it's because they, they haven't established that, that, that relationship where they feel they can. They met me two days ago and they're telling me this stuff already. So there, there is that mutual um, bond. Um, so again, we're like the engagers in this. Um, and like I said, the medical chain spent a lot of time trying to speak to these people. I think in the in the UK, you you, you get 22 sessions of therapy. Um, that's what I was given. Um, and that 22 sessions, 20 of them was me just trying to figure out who the psychologist was and am I going to talk to her or not. Um, so it, it did me no favours whatsoever. Um, so it, it's again, it's looking at how we can do things on these projects, take away information, and then be able to pass it on to the medical chain or pass it on to um, some sort of documentation what they can then give to their chain. Um, to, to go through this. So again, it, it's the crux of what we're doing, we're trying to promote this peer support network, we're trying to create this network of individuals that are like-minded on projects, all have similar project, uh, problems, and using them to create that baseline to be able to uh, understand what's going on and, and help each other get through these experiences. And why is it important? It's important to reconcile these narratives, okay? These, these traumatic incidents that these people think are suffering by themselves um, because of experiences of war, well, they're not, people, they're not suffering by themselves. These are um, problems that most people have got. Um, it's them understanding it's a natural process that they're going through, uh, and it's just how they deal with it from then. The further we got into these projects, we started looking at other effects. So what, what other um, factors um, are impacting on, on the servicemen? And you have the suicide rates, a high suicide rate. Um, so Castro um, had developed a theory, this is on um, American veterans, the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide in a military community, a really catchy title. And basically it looks at three things. Um, in order to commit suicide, um, you, look, you need uh, three factors. A strong, pers uh, strong perception that you're a burden, um, a sense of uh, not belonging, a sense of isolation, 
and also the acquired ability to enact lethal self-harm. As a veteran, it's already been established, or as a service personnel, that you've already got that ability to enact lethal self-harm. So straight away, from having three um, factors to see, that comes to two. Uh, and then if we look back at this list, what people describe that they suffer from, we can see that of them, um, two remaining factors, self-imposed isolation and burdensomeness rate high on most of the people. So if you're looking at the general military population, straight away they've got a predisposition. If you, if you pers um, prescribe that model of suicide, theoretically they're, they've got... Um, Well, they have to meet the criteria, basically. It's a ticket bomb waiting to happen. Um, so it's a case of looking at what, what we can do now um, to help reduce that, if that is what we believe is happening. So what we do is, part of our projects, we like to, we, ha we have a baseline. Um, what we want to do is we want to build upon um, this peer support network. Um, and by getting people engaged in the project, getting people engaged in, in this peer group, starting to contribute again and um, people that have been isolated for two or three years in their home doing not a lot getting back into society is, is a big step for them um, and by getting back involved in these projects um, they are starting to contribute again and it's starting to increase their feelings of um, value being valued but it's also starting to um, decrease the feelings of isolation now the way we record this is um, we will do um, surveys of the first day of a project and the last day of a project um, and we'll only survey people that have been on the project for at least a week. Uh, we do projects that are two days a day. The data you're going to get from that, I don't think it is really um, meaningful. Um, so we'll, we'll look at at least a week. Um, and these are just questions that we've put into the surveys that we use. Um, so we can see that um, self-declared feelings of isolation for 38 participants um, uh, has the trend is reversed. So the top bar is the pre-project and the bottom bar is post-project. Uh, and the self-declared feelings of value, again, it's reversed again. So people have gone from not feeling valued at all to feeling valued sometimes more so time than always. So there, there is a change in that. Um, so again, that's taking the suicide element away from it. And by engaging them, again, we're seeing that we're getting groups forming. We're getting peer groups um, that are developing from that. The surveys we use then is we use the, um, the GAD7, which is um, an anxiety survey. So it's, it's a self-prescribed um, set of questions. Uh, and what this does is it measures their anxiety levels pre and post projects. Um, and this is from a sample group of 42 people. Um, so we can see again, pre and post projects, um, the trends are reversing quite significantly. Um, we also do the PHQ8. We do the eight and not the nine. Um, the PHQ9 will look for um, it will ask the suicide question, do you, um, do you have suicidal tendencies or whatever? Um, and obviously the, the, the danger of have asking that question is if they say yes, then it opens up a whole new dynamic of what we have to then provide for them. Um, so they've developed a PHQ-8, which means that it's got all the same questions, but not the suicide risk. And again, you can see that from the depression scale, um, it is shifting, so people are leaving the project feeling less depressed um, than when they came on. And also we use a Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. So we're looking for anxiety, depression, um, and the well-being element itself. Um, and this well-being is, is an interesting one um, because it's, it, it scores your well-being from high, moderate, and low. Um, but there's a big bracket within each category. So although you can see there is a definite shift from low well-being to people getting better, what you can't really see in this is those that are suffering from low well-being in the extreme area and then getting a positive uh, they will be increasing, but still being within that low bracket, but just to be on a borderline low, so the, on that moderate to, to low bracket. Um, so although the data you can see there is, is a lot better, and it, it does show that an increase in well-being, you need to break it down even further. To, and you can actually, I, I think we've had one instance where um, one participant has walked away um, scoring lower than this, but then when we looked into it, his wife had just um, taken him to the cleaners in a divorce, he'd lost his medical pension, he'd lost all this information. So then when you, you kind of put it into context, well, I think everybody's um, well-being would decrease a little bit on that. Um, so across the board, we, 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 other than that one instance, we've had no um, negative effects on the well-being. So moving forward then, we need to deliver more projects that are inciting and will engage the individuals. Okay, Th these projects need, to, it has to be engaging, otherwise we won't get an interest from it. Um, promoting best practice in archaeology, so the archaeology can't suffer as a result of making these guys feel better. You still have to provide world-class archaeology um, and also um, world-class um, 
well-being support and well-being mentoring. Um, we need to look at the social prescribing element uh, and make sure that these sorts of projects are sustainable. Um, well, we've proved now over four, uh, four or five years that it is sustainable. Um, getting the GPs to then refer people to, to these projects um, is, is another obstacle because each practice has got its own um, channels of reporting <coughs> things in different counties um, are, are slightly different. Um, so that, that is a bit of a struggle. Um, but looking to incorporate what we do um, into the recovery program of the, of the beneficiary. So if, he, if they've got a, um, a recovery program from their um, wellbeing advisor, um, from their um, mental health um, specialist or whatever, it's looking at how we can use what they've already got and incorporate into that, incorporate um, our, our work into that and also feed back into that in a positive way. Um, so it's about being as reactive as possible with what we're doing, but at the same time still building upon um, the extra support that these guys are getting, because we're not psychologists, we don't want, we don't pretend to be psychologists, um, we are just archaeologists delivering these projects, so we need to work with as many different disciplines as possible to really understand how this works, and then look to create some sort of formula to make this um, more productive. Any questions, guys? Thank you. Thank you.